Welcome back to the Black Letter Podcast. We set out to create an entertaining and exciting podcast about law and business. Black Letter, the name, comes from the Gothic typeset. Over time, Black Letter became the only font that English law books were printed in. It made it harder for kind of the common person to understand what the English law books said. Black Letter came to represent something that was law, that was set in stone, that was sort of old and a well-settled fundamental principle of law. We're here to demystify black letter law. We're here to demystify things that happen in business and law and where those two meet. And I hope you have fun listening. Hi, this is Tom Dunlap. Welcome back to another episode of the Black Letter Podcast. Thanks for joining us with me this week. I've got a sort of unique guest, Jeremy Conrad writes for the Washington DC Bar Journal and the DC chapter, and is a member of the DC chapter of Society for Professional Journalists. He won their Dateline Award for an article he wrote in 2020 about conservative support for the elimination of qualified immunity, which sort of interested in what that was, and an SPJ Award for an article he co-authored about the Afghan refugee crisis. So my interest, Jeremy and I were talking outside of this, and my interest in Jeremy when we were chatting about an article he was working on was the fact that he was a practicing lawyer, as was his wife, and now they're both full-time committed journalists, but not journalists in any field, literally specifically in the field of law. And so we got to talking, and in my thought process, I asked Jeremy if that shapes uh, how you look at things, Jeremy. And, and welcome, by the way. Sorry, I just started diving into questions. But welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I tried to do an introduction, but it didn't do me justice. Do you Thank justice you. No, I, I thought I thought it uh, it did a pretty good job of uh, setting a foundation. Yeah, um, Jeremy Conrad. I'm a lawyer, licensed to practice in New York and Florida. New York's where I went to law school, and had a number of years uh, in, in practice as an immigration and criminal defense attorney, primarily. Although I also did some contract work in, in a corporate legal environment. I do enjoy the unique perspective that reporting on the law gives me. That's distinct from my perspective as a practitioner, because it does give me a little bit of a conceptual distance. I'm a very curious person, and especially in this day and age when there are so many interesting social justice issues and questions about how how should we best organize and operate a society as a large proposition. Where I stand, I think, gives me um, a great view of that. I get to talk to the people who are pulling the levers, but I'm, I'm less entangled myself. Uh, I, I no longer fight the fights or have to take position. So Jeremy, your, your journal is, it, it seems like from what I understand, deep dives into specific subjects. I mean, hearing about conservative support for qualified immunity, doing away with qualified immunity, which again, I'm sort of interested like why they would want to do away with that, because that's a great tool in a prosecutor's toolbox and the Afghan refugee crisis. What has been your experience doing deep dives into things as opposed to, and I'm kind of curious, and no holds barred here, but I do a podcast and you know that's not really journalism, is it? Or is it, I mean, is it a species of journalism? It's not what you do. I ask people like you to come on the show and we chat and there's so many people with podcasts and I feel like that people consume information in these bite-sized, I have trouble these days, believe it or not, sitting down and reading an article in like The Atlantic or a New York Times article because they're just so long. And I never had that. For, Ten years ago, I read all the time and I still read, but I can't consume news in such large or information in such large chunks unless I'm reading a book or something like that. So what, what has been your uh, experience with that or what are your thoughts? On that? As a writer for the D.C. Bar our publication, our magazine is distributed to the largest mandatory bar in, in the world, effectively. We're, we're talking about 100,000 uh, licensed attorneys scattered across 80 different countries. We're talking about people who are leaders in their fields, experts in what they do. And I have a significant challenge in trying to provide them with content that's substantial, something that's that they can really get their teeth into. And yet, still maintains a little bit of accessibility because although all of my readers are going to be licensed attorneys and therefore quite sharp, quite capable in their own way, if I'm writing about family law and a tax attorney 
is reading the article. I hope to have something accessible to them. But likewise, that tax attorney, if I write about family law, I need to thread the needle really carefully to try and give them something that's that's not so one on one that uh, it'll it'll bore them to tears, and not so boutique and exotic that there's right. nothing for them to lay fa- hands on. Yeah, I see that in a lot of bar journals. I see that sometimes too, where the Virginia State I get the DC Bar Journal, which you write for. I've been getting it for more than twenty years, and I also get the Virginia, and I get the Maryland one, and I get some other bar journals. I got licensed in a bunch of states and you just get their bar journals, right? But I see that um, they're each, what's another interesting thing, and I guess, have you looked at other states? Because I feel like the DC bar journal and what you're talking about, Virginia's approach is similar, but Maryland's is not quite the same. They tend to publish shorter articles. Virginia publishes more in-depth, long articles, and they'll have like the construction law issue or the elder law issue. They tend to do sort of substantive subject matter issues. And that's not the approach there. What What's the difference and what are your thoughts on how different bar journals approach communicating with their members? Yeah, so, uh, of course, there's an enormous amount of variety because it, some states have multiple bar associations, uh, vo- voluntary bar associations, right. mandatory bar associations. Um, uh, and each of those bar associations, if they have publications, do have to answer a question for themselves. What What are we doing to serve our our membership are are we simply providing them with a social newsletter that that tells you what's going on specifically literally within the community who's been hired who started their own firm uh who, who's having a picnic this coming weekend that's that's one tack that a that an organization could take you could try to write very scholarly materials primers on all sorts of things at the DC bar, we're not quite trying to do either of those things. There are social service functions that the publication serves. There are some educational functions that the publication serves. But I think my mission is to try to excite and connect attorneys who are members of the DC bar with really remarkable thing that practice is, which is a hands-on involvement in just about every issue that society faces at any given moment and it gives me a pretty broad territory to to walk jeremy how is your story choice and this is something my um former law partner was an anchorman for nbc in fairbanks alaska a long time ago we had a long conversation i was a reporter for a newspaper in college i worked for the loudon times mirror which i don't even know if it exists anymore we had a conversation about story choice because I asked him what changed when you left the news world to go, you went back to law school. And he said, well, the station got acquired and story choice changed. And that's how media organizations can really affect, you know, what they publish. How does that work in the DC bar? Because I will say the perception is there's a great focus or emphasis on pro bono and things that a bar organization probably should focus on and do and professionalism and ethics. But do you have control over story choice? Do you ever get direction? How does that work at a bar journal? Yeah, there, so there are there are situations in which I'm asked to write on a particular topic. Uh, we our, our November December issue is typically devoted to pro bono because, as, as you point out, as a bar association, encouraging and highlighting opportunities to fulfill pro bono requirements is a big part of our messaging. So I, I might be asked to cover specific pro bono programs. How I go about covering it is is often left up to me. And then for most of the year, I would say for the most part, I get to pitch topics that I think are interesting. They're not always taken. Sometimes I'm interested in something that that might be uh, a little too touchy, but from a from an editorial viewpoint, to to discuss within the pages of the publication. My my uh, uh, colleague John Murph and I talked at one point about writing about efforts to um, legalize uh, sex work in the district, and it's a serious issue, and it's an issue worth thinking about. And there are sure. members of the bar who are, who serve on the um, city council that that were actively advancing legislation that would uh, decriminalize sex work. And they have reasons for that. And they're nonprofit organizations that are ready to talk about it. But of course, once you start talking about sex, it, it can be very, uh, 
Yeah, it's a touchy a subject. Issue. Yeah, it's sort, of, sort of similarly, recently I was pitching an article about um, ghost guns and the ghost gun law in D.C., which you might wow. be aware of. Uh, 2019, yeah. ghost guns were, were made unlawful in the district. Um, so for listeners, real quick, can you tell us what a ghost gun is? I actually know about this issue, but um, but yeah, tell us what a ghost gun is. Sure. Uh, so uh, the firearms kits can be purchased online pretty pretty widely available and uh on account of prior case history it, it has been determined that these kits are not firearms per se and as such you don't have to register there's no uh id or clearance process you you simply no order. background checks no serial number attached to the name so in yes. other words a ghost gun yeah, yeah. It's become an increasing problem. More ghost guns were seized in the district than any other year in, in history. Wow. And those those sorts of numbers are rising. Everywhere we're seeing 10 to 20 percent of the guns seized in a lot of jurisdictions are are these kit guns um, yeah. that obviously are more difficult to trace and very easy to get in the hands of people who shouldn't have them because there's orders of protection or past felony or some, some other barrier to the to, to the gun ownership. They've been used in mass shootings as well. But I, I, I spoke to the attorney, uh, George Lyons, uh, who previously won a Supreme Court case against the district for um, the wholesale ban on firearms in the district. That was found to be unconstitutional. He's, right. currently, he's currently challenging the ghost gun prohibition. He's got another suit challenging the prohibition on the carrying of firearms in the metro. So once once again, I, I think that topic might be a little too hot, a little too emotional, a little too contentious gotcha. right now. I probably won't get to run with that. <laughs> but Wow, that's so interesting because both of the topics you've talked about as a DC Bar Journal subscriber are probably things I would, probably the first articles I would turn to because they're interesting. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of, I won't say disappointed, but sad that, you know, you, you can't pursue things um, that uh, that are really hot. You have to kind of, you know, take vanilla things uh, or more vanilla approaches to things. I have to give my editors a lot of credit because they are they are quite brave and they are quite trusting and they will run. with. Oh, they're me. conscious of your you have 100,000 members of your bar. I get it. And a massively diverse population of people. And you have to kind of go out of your way to try not to offend 80% of them at any given stroke of the pen. Totally get it. And, and they're the ones that, I mean, it is it is a different kind of new, new, you're not the fourth estate in this case. Unfortunately, you're not the New York Times, which I understand your wife writes for them. You're, you're the DC Bar Journal and the mem you're the member's journal. So you've got to, yeah. I, I get it. It's just interesting to me. The qualified immunity article, I think it, it yeah. illustrates some, some of the ways that I can try to find balances and, and try to accommodate because it, it is a, it's an active concern for me, the fact that there is such a huge diversity within the bar. I don't want to be producing content that's tailored for one group and excludes another. I, I, I want to be able to produce stories that are going to have meaningful entry point for anybody, no matter where they fall on an issue. Qualified immunity was interesting to me because there was a lot of discussion of defund the police. And defund the police is itself incredibly complex and a, something of a, a misnomer in the, in the way of things. You know, just, just like ghost guns, there's values associated with the term. And I, I'll tell you that Mr. Mr. Lyon would not like me calling them ghost guns. He has other terms that he prefers. Um, what, what are the other terms? What else do you call them? Kit guns? I, I think he calls them kit guns or... or Personally, PMS, personally manufactured firearm. I, I'm an ex-army officer. I've shot all kinds of guns. I was a cavalry guy. I shot all kinds of guns. I don't know that we need ghost guns. That's kind of yeah. a strange thing to have a need for. That's a little weird. But anyway, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. yeah no. I, so, so qualified immunity, I thought, was an interesting angle to take in because qualified immunity, as you may be aware, is the doctrine that protects uh, police officers from liability for acts that they undertake in the course of their their duties that are not clearly unconstitutional. And the problem with qualified immunity is that last bit, the not clearly constitutional bit, because as it turns out, there's a lot of really terrible stuff that's 
not clearly unconstitutional. Ah, so I didn't understand that from, from the quick bio I read, because qualified immunity is also something prosecutors can grant to a defendant as opposed to a police officer. So I understand now that this is a much more controversial subject than merely whether or not the prosecutor should have the tool. I assume that wasn't the subject of the article at all. No, this the, the subject of the article, the, I spoke to some folks at Cato Institute and a couple other gotcha. conservative think tanks that, um, you know, and, and I really appreciated their perspective. They, they, they're they approaching it from a sort of libertarian viewpoint where they say that no one should be protected from the impact of the law. Just because you're a government officer, you should not uh, have your acts treated differently than if you were uh, a gotcha. citizen. That makes um, sense. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Awesome. So, Jeremy, some career questions, I guess I'll ask. So how much content do you produce on a weekly basis in terms of like number of articles or pages written? Just curious how much of a, uh, you know, obviously you have to research your stories, but what does that result in if somebody's like, hey, I'm a lawyer and I'd like to be a journalist as well or a law journalist. I'm interested in this space. So th there's a huge range depending on the publication that you're working for and, and its needs. Uh, in, in my case, I write primarily for the magazine which is published every other month. So we have six issues a year. I also produce content for the web, for a, for a blog and, and a web page, and, and I write some, some news items and produce some internal documents for the bar. Now, on the whole, I would say I'm probably producing two or three small pieces for the web a week, and then another two to three much larger pieces for the, for the bi-monthly publication. Um, gotcha. Do you guys do a podcast or do you have a plan? To, is the DC Bar going to do one? Well, so the DC Bar has a couple of podcasts, but the, uh, John Murph and I, the, the, the other writer, we, we have uh, recorded a pilot and, and, and we're planning on, on putting it together. With the pandemic, it complicated things a little bit. Right. And, and then when you work for a large organization, there's a lot of uh, sort of walking around, just pitching the project, getting, getting the clearances that you need and so forth. So uh, we, had, we had both uh, administrative and practical uh, obstacles, but I'm hoping that, that we can do that this year. If there are three things that you could say or two things or a couple pieces of advice you could give to somebody who's looking to do more legal writing, to do more journalism, I guess, if you will, or I don't, whatever you want to call the profession that you're in, I guess it's legal journalism. Um, what advice would you give? What are the things that that have been kind of touchstones or or your north star? Well, you know, it's it's really helpful to to not be afraid of being foolish. There's an interesting pivot that takes place when you go from practicing the law to reporting on the law. In the practice of law, a person attempts to build a degree of authority uh, in in the area in which they practice. As a journalist. It's often it's sometimes a hindrance if I know too much. I must ask some foolish questions. Right. I must approach things from a, a, a place of ignorance in order to elicit the statements uh, that I need from my source. Yeah, in yeah. Order to tell the story. It can be humiliating sometimes <laughs> because I, I speak to very bright people about the things that they are best at, I often do have to ask them exactly the wrong question, um, uh, make exactly the mistake that everybody's making so that I can be corrected and so that that correction can be part of the story that I tell. Uh, uh, you get to tell the story so you can make yourself, you don't have to make yourself look like you asked a foolish question. You can make it look like a wise question at the end, I suppose, right? And, and and hopefully I'll mostly disappear in the end. One of the nice things that I like, you, you know, lawyering can be very performative. And I have a performative aspect to my personality, but I, I very much like the in the shadows aspect of journalism. I get to fade into the background and in my place come the words of the pe smart people that I spoke to. And and nice. some nice, hopefully, bridging language to to push things along, and 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 honestly, hopefully, there's not too much of myself left in the in the end. Excellent. So those so the two big points I'm taking away are: don't be afraid to ask foolish questions and be foolish, 
and push forward for the per point of the story. And then secondly, don't, I mean, as a journalist, I guess you have to disappear. It's not your personality, the article, it's the subject of the story, the article that you've got to draw out, which is very different from being an advocate for someone. I mean, I guess not too different, but lawyers inject a lot of themselves into their regular legal writing because they're adversarial and they're ar arguing for one point or another. As a journalist, you have to do your best to tell an unbiased story. And you can't look foolish when you're practicing law, or you can, but it's hard to. Um, mm -hmm. So very different. Your clients are different people. Awesome. Yeah. Is there anything else, Jeremy, that you can think of that would be good for our listeners to know about your field or you or what you do? Well, you, you raise another interesting point there, which is that um, lawyering is very goal-oriented. You come in ready to build the narrative that's to some extent predetermined. My, my client right. is innocent or or my client deserves clemency, some leniency. In my case, I try not to come into a story with the... the Preconceived notions. Exactly. I, yeah. I, I hopefully am going to maintain some space that's open for possibility and, and let other people tell me how things are coming out. In that I mean, way. it kind of makes us sad about what we do as lawyers in a way, because that's a huge, you're a criminal defense attorney. And whereas before you were looking for the story to tell to win your case, because that's your obligation as a criminal defense attorney. And I haven't done criminal, I was the prosecutor, but not a criminal defense attorney. So same thing, other side of the coin, we were looking for a goal, whereas you're looking for the truth. I mean, to some degree, as a journalist, as a legal journalist, you actually get to find the truth of the law and what you're doing without, and you know, I think, and I'll just say this, not that I'm great at getting blog content out or articles out. I wish I was better at it. I do write like the Virginia CLE Essentials of IP book every two years if you redo that. But it's rare as a lawyer that you get to try to find out the actual truth of something. And I kind of enjoy that. I'll say this maybe when you do your podcast, but in podcasting, we get to kind of journey together with guests, or I get to just look into things I'm interested in and try to find the truth of things because it's not my case. And it's so different than being a lawyer. It's so enjoyable. So I don't know. I, I think that's interesting because I haven't really thought of it that way. So awesome. Well, thank you, Jeremy, for joining us. I appreciate it. That was awesome. And such a unique perspective on the law and something different uh, than our normal guests usually talk about business and business advice, how to push your business forward. This is really something aimed at lawyers and your thoughts when they read articles in bar journals, one or two, when they're writing themselves. I think this is really helpful to think about the way they write and the way they interact with their, their text. So thank you so much for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Black Letter Podcast. Download us wherever you get your podcast: the iTunes Store, Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you on the next episode of the Black Letter Podcast. That's all for today's episode of Black Letter. Thanks again for listening. Join us next time when we talk about more Black Letter issues in creative ways. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And check out our website at blackletterstudios.com.